This conference will to, now be recorded. Hey Amen. I want to welcome everybody to our Bible study tonight on 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. And this Bible study tonight is tailored to teach us that God can use us to encourage others in spite of our past. God can use us uh, to encourage others in spite of our past. Um, and that's that's the main thrust of the lesson is that God can use us to encourage others in spite of our past. Um, our schedule this week, we are in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. And we will take a break February 10th and 17th for Black History. Uh, we have updated our schedule, so please make sure that you've got the SBC Ipsy app or you've got the schedule from our website. Uh, we've we've updated the schedule, and so uh, we thank God for each of you who joined us tonight. Um, I want to go over our text, which is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 20, and then we'll get into our study. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 20, and I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible, which we will be using all year long. I encourage you to get one if you haven't already. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. Um, Y'all hold on a second. My son's got this game system on and I don't I don't know how to turn it off. Um, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. I give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man, but I received grace, I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of them. Uh, Christ Jesus, I am the worst of them, but I received mercy for this reason so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King, eternal and mortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you, so that by recalling them, you might fight the good fight having faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected and have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered to Satan, so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. Amen. Uh, that's our lesson tonight. Uh, so let's get into this a little bit. Let's just remember that last week, Paul uh, talked to us about uh, Paul's writing to Timothy. And he urged him to provide instruction um, um, that would that would uh, stop people from paying attention to bad doctrine, and um, um, would also encourage people to remember that God wants us to live fruitful lives uh, rather than to be caught up in immorality. And so Paul continues that discussion. Uh, tonight, but he gets personal about his own experience. He gets personal about his own experience. Uh, so uh, all right, so he gets personal about his own experience and he he gets into the fact that he is grateful. His ministry, is motivated by the fact that he's grateful for what God has done. Uh, Paul thanked God for changing him. Um, and we have to remember what his character was like. And if you go back to Acts chapter six, seven, and eight, uh, in chapter nine, the, Paul runs into the Lord, literally. Um, and, and, and we have to remember what he was like, and he describes himself as a blasphemer. Uh, he 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 did not believe in Jesus. Uh, he spoke against him. He chased down the people who were 
followers of Jesus had them locked up uh, into prison, men and women. Uh, some of them may have even been murdered. And Paul was also arrogant. He couldn't be taught. He wouldn't listen. Um, he thought he knew everything. Uh, he was arrogant and he was uh, uh, acting out of ignorance. And that's why he received mercy because of the grace of God. And so Paul ministry is motivated by great by gratefulness. And here's an important point that comes from our uh, lesson text, not skill or knowledge from Dr. Constable's notes, but faithfulness is the first qualification for a minister of Christ. Faithfulness, and God rewards faithfulness. And so if there's anybody out there and you're worried about, has the Lord forgotten about me? I would encourage you to remember that the Lord rewards faithfulness. Out of all of the things that Paul writes here, he gives thanks to God. Um, um, and he talks about how deeply thankful he is that God's grace uh, showed up in his life. Let me ask you a question tonight. Is there anybody on here tonight that knows that you didn't deserve it, but God saved you? and that you are grateful uh, for his ministry. Yes, uh, his sir. His call on your life. Yeah. See, yeah, see, some of us, yeah, we know. <laughs> we know where we would have been. So I want to I want to I want to just ask this question and this is not a rhetorical question. Does anybody care to to express how you feel knowing now what you know about salvation? um as being a person who's a believer in jesus now versus when you first came to christ anybody have any expression about that that this that this piece of the lesson impact you well yes it definitely impacted me the way how he was the worst of them all you know what I mean? He didn't deserve it at all. And, and Jesus Christ forgave him, but forgave him from his, uh, I want to say the way he, he carried out, you know, he didn't know he was doing wrong. You know, he didn't know that he was, he was, uh, uh persecuting people or actually going against God, but God forgave him. That's the biggest part. He forgave him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Does, does anybody have any sense of why the Lord, why Paul puts this in his letter? I want to say for how thankful he was. Yes, he's expressing his thankfulness. Absolutely. Why else? I would say um, testimony as as a testimony of of what has what what is to come what what came to him based on how his behavior was and how you know his ways were and if if it could be turned around for me it could be turned around for you mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely anybody else have any thoughts about this let me share this with us we should never take God's mercy and his grace and his call on our life to salvation for granted. None of us deserved it. <laughs> and we might be super saved now. <laughs> somebody, somebody said that Garth Brooks sang Amazing Grace today like he was Sunday school saved. Uh, we, we might be Sunday school saved, but we all know uh, that we didn't deserve it. And, and, and so Paul is grateful. Now there's another piece of this. He acted in ignorance and it is possible as Paul was to be sincere, but to be sincerely wrong. As some of you all who have a sense of history know who this is on this picture. Um, um, Paul did not oppose the Lord because he wanted to dishonor God, he believed he was serving God by persecuting Christians. 
He was mistaken about who Jesus Christ was. And for this reason, God had mercy on him. It is possible to be sincere, but to be sincerely wrong. Some of those folks on January 6th were sincere, but they were sincerely wrong. And there are there are some people today who are praising God for a new president and a new vice president. And we're grateful that there was a peaceful transfer of power. But don't forget that po po politically elected people can be sincere, but they can be sincerely wrong. Anybody know who this was that's on the picture right here? Idi Amin. Yes. And Idi Amin was very passionate about what he believed, but he was very wrong. And so it is possible to be passionate, to be sincere, but to be sincerely wrong. Okay, and Paul said because of that, he considered himself to be the worst sinner. Um, um, and 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 there was a remember that the early church had creeds and things that they memorized, and Paul quotes a piece of it. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of a full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That little piece right there, Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, uh, was, was thought to be something that the early church memorized so that they could spread the gospel and remember why Christ came. Um, and Paul considered himself the worst sinner. Listen, let me share with us that it does not matter how sordid our past is. The Lord loves us and he desires our salvation. And one of the things that we cannot do is forget where the Lord brought us from, but we also can't live back there either. And one of the things that the devil wants to use to, to keep us from being the productive, powerful, victorious believers that we are to be is he wants to constantly remind us of our past and what we are not. Um, and so Paul is aware of who he used to be, but the Lord saved him. Okay, and verse 16 says, I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Sometimes we don't want to tell our story. We don't want to tell people what we used to be and where we came from and how the Lord saved us and what he saved us from. But Paul was not ashamed. Um, of how the Lord had saved him because he recognized that that made him an example for others uh, who would believe, okay? Uh, any questions? All right. Dr. Deacon, Deacon Reeves here. Yes, sir. I believe when you testify about what God has done for you, um you're defeating the devil at that same time but long as you're not boasting about how things happen but giving god all the glory he would take that fear and that shame from you as you testify on point behalf of his name yes sir yes sir because it is possible to boast about what we used to do is that what you're saying yes sir Okay, okay. Others, anybody else have perspective on that? Yeah, because see, we can spend too much time talking about what we used to do and not enough time talking about how the Lord delivered us and where we are now. Um, um, and so let me, let me remind us that we all have a past. We all, uh, sinned we all have come short of the glory of god and so we should a be careful about beating up on other people for what the lord has delivered them from but then two uh remember that that god has mercy on us as examples for others and none of us have arrived yet okay um and so and so he he his 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 memory of where the lord brought him from uh prompts Paul 
to wind up in praise. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. Paul gives Jesus Christ the honor that he is due, the praise. He breaks out in worship in the middle of his reminder of Timothy. In the middle of his instruction, he breaks out in worship and speaks of the glory of God uh, because he saved him. Okay, And that's something else I want to encourage us to do is as we learn more about the Lord and who he is and his attributes, uh, it ought to cause us to be more in line with worship and, to, and and we shouldn't be afraid of that. Some of us are so sophisticated and so in control that we sometimes are afraid to release our emotions in worship. Uh, but But Paul was not afraid to praise God for who he is and the fact that he saved him, all right? Um, um, but he doesn't stay there. He takes the time to deal with what he came to deal with. And he tells Timothy to fight the good, to, to fight the good fight. Uh, he says to him, Timothy, my son, I am giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies uh, uh, previously made about you so that by recalling them, you may fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and shipwrecked their faith. Um, um, what we fight with, our weapons for warfare, um, are the gospel and godly concern for the spiritual condition of our opponents. Uh, our weapons, the minister's weapons, are the gospel and godly concern for the spiritual condition of the opponent. Politics is all right. Social justice is all right. Um, um, helping people uh, change their status in life is good, but we can never leave out the gospel and to be concerned for the spiritual condition of those who oppose us, okay? Um, um, as I was studying this, I thought about a couple of things. Number one, God had given Timothy a word uh, that had come through those who were around him who could see what the Lord was doing in his life. And they prayed over him and they asked the Lord to guide him and to give him what he needed for the ministry that he was going to be uh, engaging in. They saw something in Timothy that he hadn't even seen in himself and they spoke to him about it. And that's what's meant about it in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you. Um, um, they saw something in him and they shared with him uh, what the Lord had revealed to the apostles. Uh, and so sometimes we have to remember who we are, how God has saved us, how he has equipped us, how he is developing us so that we can keep on fighting this gospel fight, okay? Uh, let me share something with us though. Don't ever forget that there's opposition. The Lord is blessing Second Baptist Church. Don't ever forget though, that there is opposition. Don't ever forget that there's an enemy that we fight. And sometimes the enemy is the inner me, but there's also an external enemy. And the Bible says that we should be where the devil our adversary goes around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so Paul reminds Timothy to remember what he learned in God's word, remember uh, uh, how God had called him and planned to use him so that he could keep going. Because there are some who get discouraged, distracted, or defeated, and they shipwreck their faith, okay? And Paul, ooh, I don't know what's happening. Hold on a second. Uh, ooh, I don't want to do that. Okay. And two of them are Hymenaeus and Alexander. Okay. Hymenaeus and Alexander. Now, we don't know a whole lot about them, but 2 Timothy. Uh, chapter 2, verse 16, uh, tells us that they were 
uh, false teachers. Hymenaeus was a false teacher and he had departed from the truth and he was ruining the faith of others by telling them that the resurrection had already taken place. Uh, we know that Alexander uh, did great harm to Paul. And if you read Acts chapter 19, Alexander may have been one of the idol makers that opposed Paul and caused him to have to leave Ephesus where Timothy is, okay? So what Paul does is what we should do when we run into people who oppose the gospel and who fight against God's plan and his program. What did Paul do with them? What does he do with them? He sent them to Satan. Turns them over to Satan. What does that mean? He was excommunicated. Okay, so they may have put them out of the church so that they could learn by what they would go through to repent. What else could it possibly mean? That he turned them over to Satan. What else could it possibly mean? So that they could stop blaspheming uh, God by their lives? Yes. Yes, the end goal was for their lives to line up with word, with God's word. Okay. Let me give you a couple of, 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 a, of biblical examples. There are times when people can be out of line with God's will. And one of the things that we have in our church covenant, there are three ways in and three ways out. What are the three ways in? Letter. Is this by um, letter? Baptism. Baptism. Yes. Yeah, Christian, Christian experience. Is. Those are the three ways in. What yeah. are the three ways out? Death. 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 Transferring to another church. Letter. Transferring to another church or excommunication being put out yeah. or exclusion exclusion is what we call it thank you deacon we call it exclusion we don't call it excommunication if a person is blatantly causing a disruption in the church and refuses to hear wise counsel and refuses to submit to leadership one of the things that we have learned is it is sometimes best to exclude them from the fellowship and treat them as if they are not a member and welcome them to worship elsewhere uh, because um, you cannot allow evil to tear up God's church and the enemy uses people to do that. And so sometimes we have to exclude people from the fellowship who are divisive and destructive. And that is one of the things that Paul may have done, okay? Now we have built and baked into our, uh, the constitutional pieces that we have been working on, a process for restoration, but, and I'll say this and some folks don't like it, we put preachers out, but we let members stay. We put preachers out for stuff that we let members do. And sometimes what the preacher did with a member, we'll put the preacher out for doing it, but we'll leave the member there. And so there are there, there, there shouldn't be a different standard, but, but what Paul does is because Hymenaeus and Alexander are so divisive, he turns them over to the enemy uh, uh, so that they can learn to repent, okay? Let me give you a couple of biblical examples of what this looks like. One of them is Jonah. What does God tell Jonah to do? Go to Nineveh and preach. Go to Nineveh and preach. And Nineveh is east. What direction does Jonah head? West to, to West. West to Joppa. And what happens to him? Great fish, swallow him up. Well, or yeah, yep. fish. 
Yeah, and before the fish swallows him up, though, everybody with Jonah is in trouble in a storm. And in order to get the storm to calm down, Jonah tells them, throw me overboard. They don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. But Jonah has already told them that he's fleeing from the Lord. And the Lord sends, uh, dispatches a storm to go get Jonah. Now, don't forget that in Job chapter one and two, all of the stuff that happens to Job at the hand of Satan looks like natural disasters, but it is the devil who's behind it all. Don't forget that. And the Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. He has the ability to impact what happens in creation. And so what Paul does is he gives them into the hands of the enemy so that they can learn how to repent, okay? And he calls them by name, okay? He calls them out by name. And we don't, we don't like to do things like this, but there are times when opposition can arise, we will have to deal with it, okay? Uh, uh, please pray, please pray, because sometimes, the, the enemy doesn't just work on us when things are going bad, but sometimes he gets really devious when things are going well, okay? So they, he delivers them to Satan so that they can learn not to blaspheme, okay? Before we get into our questions, anybody have any questions about our text or what we've been studying so far? Pastor, I'll tell you, I was quite confused by this passage that said, Paul turned them over to Satan. You know, in my mind, that level of authority and power rests with the Lord. So it was just a bit shocking for me to read that Paul turned them over to Satan. But when you say maybe that, he um, put them out of the out of the church or withdrew uh, from trying to teach them. Um, that makes sense to me. But yes. anyway, that, that was just yes. a bit puzzling for me. Yes, yes, because one of the things that we have to remember, too, is that the, the authority that the apostles had was different, but that the church does have authority um, um, locally, the local church uh, has authority to do certain things to ensure and preserve the fellowship, but we don't often use those tools, and sometimes we should, um, mm -hmm. um, um, because we allow too much to go on sometimes, and things that we would not allow our family members or our children to do, we allow to happen in the Lord's house. And we shouldn't do that because it creates division um, and it creates uh, a breach in the fellowship. Um, mm -hmm. I'll give you just a, go ahead, Dee. Somebody was speaking. Oh, no, I just said, oh, oh I understand what you're saying. You know, I, yes. I, my thought went right to that. Um, the Lord will turn you over to a reprobate mind. Um, yes. In that sense, I see him turning you over to Satan. Yes, because when Nebuchadnezzar is another example, Nebuchadnezzar is in active rebellion against God, and God allows him to lose his mind for seven years until he comes to his senses. The mm -hmm. prodigal son is another example. He is buck wild in rebellion against his family and against God. And he, and he knows that he sinned against God when he winds up in a situation that's deplorable and he repents in the middle of his situation and goes back. That's what's meant by this process. Mm -hmm. um, um, and it's a process of, of discipline that's designed for deliverance. It's discipline that's designed for deliverance. It's not designed for 
permanent excommunication, but it's discipline that's designed for deliverance. And nobody can provide discipline like the Lord. So what, what, what Paul does is he withdraws the hand of fellowship and he withdraws the hand of friendship. Remember that when we extend the right hand of fellowship to somebody, that's the right hand of fellowship. That's the right hand of friendship. And it's the right hand of the authority of the church. But that same way that that hand can be extended, it can also be removed. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's what he has to do with these guys. If you read on in the second Timothy and you read Acts chapter 19, they stay mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. They stay out there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So Thank it's, you. it's uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I saw somebody else had a question. Go ahead. Or a comment. All right. Let's let's roll into our questions then. Let's roll into our questions. Nobody wants to admit. <laughs> but some of us have had the Lord allow, you know, allow some things to happen in our lives to get us to straighten up. And if it didn't happen directly in our lives, sometimes it happened close by. Sometimes it happened close. I'll never forget. Somebody told me when I saw what happened to so and so, it made me straighten up. And so sometimes the Lord has to work uh, in this way uh, for the benefit and the blessing of the body of Christ. All right. All right. Question one Why did Paul thank God? For having mercy upon him, delivering him have, from his sin. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for having mercy upon him, delivering him from his sinful past. Hallelujah. Uh, question two What was Paul like before he was converted? A violent man. It was violent. What else? A, a blasphemer uh, and an arrogant man. He was violent. He was a blasphemer, which meant he spoke against uh, the Lord and he was arrogant. And um, a persecutor. Um, and a persecutor. Yes, yes. Thank you all. Um, um, why did the Lord call somebody like that? <laughs> into ministry. It's always well, for but to use him as an example. If as an example, transform a center like Paul, anyone could be transformed. All right, all right, Sister Donna, what were you saying? I was going to say, but. You know, one thing, Paul was very committed and passionate about his false beliefs. And I'm sure God looked at him and thought, wow, if he was on my side, look how powerful and how committed he would be. So um, for me, I always thought of Paul as very, a very passionate and strongly committed uh, soldier. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even when he was wrong. Mm -hmm. He was committed. Sometimes God can take the personality traits that we have and turn them toward him and use them for good. Um, and to give a powerful testimony, Pastor. And to give a powerful testimony. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One of the uh, young people that I taught, the first time I met him, they brought him to me in handcuffs. I may have told y'all this before. I'm guilty for telling stories. I apologize. But he had hospitalized a grown man, and this he was in the sixth grade for insulting his sister at a skating rink. That young man right now is a deputy sheriff in a in a huge county in Texas. 
he had leadership, he had a sense of protection, he had a sense of justice, but it was warped. But when the Lord straightened him out, now he uses it for good. And the Lord can, can straighten anybody out when he gets ready. I want you to think of some people that you're gonna pray for this week that some folk have given up on. And don't holler out, don't holler out. But I want you to think about them because if the Lord will get his hand on him, and he will, he can use any of us for his glory. So let's think about who we're going to pray for. Question four, why had Paul opposed Christ? Ignorance. Unbelief. Oh, what was the first word you said? Ignorance. Ignorance. He just didn't know better. And we should be careful about expecting people that don't know better to do better. Okay. He 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 did it in ignorance and unbelief. Okay. And so why had he received mercy? Talk to me now. Why did the Lord give him mercy? Um, this is a, a direct pull from uh, um, Constables, uh, uh, the point that uh, salvation can be undeserved and that, um, and that uh, when Paul opposed Christ and persecuted the church in the past, he had not yet pr uh, professed faith. Um, yeah, that's what, that's what I have in, in part. That he had not yeah. done it. So, um, yes, as opposed to, I think if the way that I am reading this right, that, that like the false teachers, that they at least knew the truth, but still chose to kind of deviate and warp away from it. From the truth. Yes. And so there's a, Paul is drawing a contrast between operating in ignorance and being redeemed and those who know the truth, but who are in rebellion, okay? Um, and he had received mercy because God wanted to save him out of his ignorance. And so how did he view himself in light of the grace of God? How did he see himself? As, as being the worst Christian ever. Yes, the worst whatever. A uh, sin, sinner. The worst sinner ever. <laughs> Paul did not allow his authority, his ability, his his travels, his power, his writing, his preaching, his refutation of 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 falsehood, his training hundreds of people in the gospel. He didn't let any of that go to his head, okay? He stayed humble. He recognized that without the Lord, he was lost. And so we have, we can never become arrogant in our, uh, uh, in our walk with Christ, okay? Um, question seven, for what reason has the Lord been merciful? Go ahead. I don't know why it just what? triggered that, but do you think that do you think that that was the uh, thorn in the flesh that he referenced? Was his past? What? Well, I don't know if it was his past. It's a possibility that it was his past, but but it is also a possibility that it was something physical. It is also possible that it was people bringing up who he used to be. We really don't know, but the Lord has a way of keeping all of us humble. And, and, and we should be grateful for that. Um, um, but what, what we also recognize is that when Paul said that he had that thorn in the flesh, he asked the Lord to remove it three times. And the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for you. So the Lord does not move this painful problem that persists in the life of Paul. But with that painful problem, 
he puts grace <laughs> so Paul can overcome. Some of us want God to take some stuff from us. But what the Lord does is he gives us something that helps us to overcome. Uh, uh, and listen, we can't change the past. We can't change the past, but we don't have to live there either. Okay. And so the Lord had been merciful to him. Uh, question eight. Uh, verse 17 is both him and benediction. How might the early church have used it? Go ahead, that, Sister Frank. Uh, that God be honored and glorified. All right. They used it to honor and glorify God. How else did they use it? I would say to bless, to bless the hearers of the word and believers of the word, Pastor. Yes, yes. There's one more facet there. Let's not miss it. What is it? That God is the one and only true God. Yes, to teach the people who the Lord is. And, and 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 it was a tone of worship, but it was also a tone of instruction. And so they used this, this small benediction to memorize who the Lord was. We need to get back into that, by the way, the concept of memorizing scripture, um, because sometimes we memorize all this garbage that's on the internet and other places. And we forget who the Lord is. And so Paul uses uh, this short little phrase in verse 17. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. The early church used phrases like that to remember who the Lord is and to worship him. All right, question nine. What was Paul urging Timothy to do in verses 18 through 19 and why? Take what the prophecy and have say, faith conscience. Yes, to remember what had been said about him, uh, and 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 to operate in faith and a good conscience. What else did you say, Sister Erica? Oh, to keep keep it with the prophecies. Yes. I heard somebody else use another phrase. What's the phrase, the, 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 the simple phrase is fight the good fight. Okay, don't give up. I remember that the, that the, the purpose of this epistle is to remind Timothy not to give up, not to throw in the town, okay? Uh, I was talking to a young ministry protege and I reminded him, you need to have some people around you to help encourage you. And you need to have some people that provide you with accountability because ministry can be lonely and frustrating. And so you have to keep going and you need people to help you keep going. And that's what Paul's doing. All right, question 10. Who are, how many is Alexander? Who are they? And what did Paul and Timothy experience? from them were they possibly leaders or teachers but they were really like um not following the word of god yes, word of yes. God, but they turned away from the word of god yes it is most likely that they were teachers in the church who were in opposition to Paul and Timothy. Um, um, 
and they were not following the word of God and they were teaching people false doctrine. Okay. Um, um, and, 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 and they were in great opposition to Paul and Timothy. Okay. All right. Um, how did Paul handle them? And we talked about this a little bit, but what did he do? He turned both men over to God's discipline because of the, because of the determination. Because of their determination yes. to live in a manner that is contrary to the will of God. Say that again, Brother Ellis. We we you broke up a little bit. Oh, I was saying that he, he turned both men over to God's discipline because of their determination to live in a manner contrary to the will of God. Yes, yes. And what was the purpose of that discipline? To repent. To repent, to repent. All right, all right. Um, and then we answered this question already. What are the minister's weapons? There were two that were mentioned. The word of God, which is the gospel and the godly concern for the spiritual condition of the evil one, which is the opponent. And the goal is to protect the faith of those who the false teachers try to influence and win back that have gone astray. Yes, we have a responsibility to protect the faith of those who are under the attack and the influence of false teachers. Sometimes that requires direct confrontation with the word of God. Um, and so, so our weapons are the word of God and our godly concern. Uh, uh, the goal is to protect the faith of believers. All right. Well, listen, we want to thank you all for participating tonight. We're going to stop our recording at this time. We thank God for